Hey you, I'm getting quite used to having you around. It's Lucy Luck, and I like to play non-traditional cozy games and make them cozy. I've received quite a few comments from people wanting to see my full playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. Since the game takes roughly 100 hours to complete, and I personally couldn't watch someone play 100 hours of gameplay, I present to you the spark notes of my Baldur's Gate Act 1 gameplay. If you end up really enjoying this, let me know down in the comments below. That way, I know if it's a good idea to do Act 2 and 3 for y'all. Without further ado, get comfy cozy, pop on some headphones if you like, and let's go on an adventure. So. I've done two videos so far where I break down the intro of this game, so I'll spare my longtime viewers the same exact monologue. I also have a cozy character creation video for this bad girl, so be sure to check that out. I decided to create an evil Cambian warlock named Carmen that is calculating and manipulative, but equally charismatic and alluring. I also created a tiefling guardian to match her, and got started. I awoke on the Nautiloid ship, confused and angry, knowing nothing about myself and my previous life. I say my name aloud to claim what part of myself is left, the Dark Urge. All we know at this point is the Dark Urge is covered in blood, has a massive headache, and needs to get out of this place. So as one does in this hellish predicament, I investigate the nearby pool, determine that it's dangerous, touch it anyway, and spend half an hour picking out a cute outfit for my adventure. I settle on a mischievous black dress that's absolutely not suited for battle and loop my way around the grody ship. The first thing I come across is a man in a chair that clearly seems to be having a bad day. After discovering this man's brain has a mind of its own, I yoink that thing and use it as a minion for my own personal gain. The brain informs me that its name is Us, and we must make our way to the helm. So to the helm we go. I don't know what a helm is. Along the way, I meet a Githyanki warrior, hellbent on my destruction. But after our brains merge, she realizes I'm not a thrall, and we pretend she didn't just try to kill me. Lazel seems useful, and I to her, so we team up to battle our way through the Nautiloid and to the helm. I still don't know what that is. Before we get there, we come across a Mind Flare pod with someone inside. It is in this moment that I realize being evil is going to be hard. And also, the mod I got with wings is going to block so many cutscenes. Determining that we have no time for stragglers, I say bye-bye to Shadowheart and cry a little bit inside as we press add. As an evil character, there is no time for stragglers, but there is absolutely time to take another 30 minutes to look through more outfits from another mod I have. After making Lazel and myself way too overpowered for Act 1, we discover that we have tadpoles in our brains that will turn us into mind flares, meet some rather unsavory types, and yeet ourselves off the ship. Even though I 100% have the ability to fly, I decide to take a little nap as I fall from the ship and let someone else save me. Thankfully that pans out. After awaking from my cozy little nap, I become disturbed to find out that I still have no memories. But I can't wait to slice my way forth to seek vengeance on whoever took my memories from me. As I begin to explore the area in which I landed, I come across a mangled fisher and take him for everything he's got. Looting this man somehow seems to have cleansed me, but overlooking this minor detail, I become giddy that I got to see a dead body. Feels like home. Further along the coast, I come across the very same woman from the Nautiloid ship that I refused to save. She is rightfully pissed, 
but after explaining to her that I was only trying to save myself, she was surprisingly cool with it. She goes on to tell me all the gritty details about the tadpoles in our brains, and how we are destined to become mind flayers. Even though I already know all of these details, I delight in telling her she's just being dramatic, and she's still totally cool with me, and even insists we team up to find a healer. She then tells me her name is Shadowheart, and I give the ominous response that I'm the Dark Urge, instead of just giving any normal name, and she says, lead the way. I become thoroughly convinced this woman would be the first to go in any horror movie. With my new beautifully naive companion, we begin our search for help. We loot some chests, we fight some brains, and I find another basket this mod lets me get cute clothes from. I make Shadowheart wear the goth girl version of her outfit if she wants to hang out with me. And then we finally see someone else. Is it a healer? No. Is it a respectable man that simply needs some help? Also no. It is a sassy assassin named Astarian. After pushing my new dagger happy friend off of me and blocking out most of the cutscene with my wings, I try to convince him to put the knife away. And our brains do that one thing. Once we've each had a sneaky peek into one another's mind, he realizes I wasn't the one to imprison him on the ship, and he apologizes for trying to murder me. I tell him I would have done the same thing, and Shadowheart goes tee. Astorian becomes curious if I happen to know more about the tadpoles, and I inform him they will turn us into mind flayers. He finds it to be an absolute gas, and then he doesn't. He goes on to reinforce the idea that the next quest is undoubtedly to find a healer, and he joins our little party. As he joins your side, your mind dances with thoughts of a perfect, pretty corpse. Huh. That was weird. At this time, I love everyone up using a build guide instead of using my own brain, and then discover that I can disguise myself to save our cutscenes from winged mayhem. While perusing my various disguise options, I decided it was time to take a break from the game for a little treat. When I came back, I had completely forgotten I was in the middle of disguising myself, and I didn't disguise myself. Instead, my companions and I moved along and discovered a mind flare. The mind flare tried to make me love it, so I squished it. It wasn't long until we stumbled upon a strange purple portal. Since I've already been in the habit of touching things that seem dangerous, what's to stop me from touching this? It zapped me, but then a mysterious hand appeared, asking for assistance. Although I'm not in the habit of assisting strangers, I was thoroughly intrigued, and questioned who he was. He ensured me that he was just an average traveler stuck between realms. I found the notion of helping an average traveler to be a boring waste of time, but given he was stuck between realms, perhaps this man wasn't so average at all. After freeing him, he said, Hello. And I had to force down all of my giddy feelings for him from previous playthroughs. He talked a lot, reinforced the idea that finding a healer is the main quest at this point, and joined our party. Now having a fourth member to complete the party, I decided to head to camp to question my new allies. While the main quest is certainly to find a healer, I had a mission of my own. I wanted to get to the bottom of my memory loss on my quest for vengeance and it became apparent none of my companions shared the same problem. Gail even went as far as rubbing it in that he has a cat, a library, and a weakness for a good glass of wine. For all I know, I could also own a cat, but the only thing I know is my capacity for murderous thoughts. On that note, I decided to end the day and was alarmed by an exclamation mark above Gail's head. I had never gotten a cutscene at this point before in my previous playthroughs, so I engaged. Go to hell. And 
good evening to you too. After a day filled with devils, mind flares, and dragons, with a tadpole infested cherry on top, Gale was brooding. While the Lucy and me wanted to comfort him in this moment of despair, I was Carmen now, so I basically told him to suck it up. After trying to rest, I was informed someone else wanted to speak with me. Shadowheart. I made my way over to see what she needed. The girl just wanted the tea. Unfortunately, gossiping was not much of an option on my end, so I told her it wasn't any of her business. And she said, yeah, huh? Anyway, she just wanted to once again state the main quest is to find a healer. Before going to bed, I decided to talk to Astarian to see if he had anything to say. And he said, You have a manner of irresistible desperation about you. I like it. And I think we are going to get along just fine, since we didn't really have any battles that day. I just did a partial rest to save on supplies, and my evening was filled with inexplicable, violent yearnings. I decided to contemplate my heritage, to see what could possibly be the explanation for them, but alas, I had no answers. I peacefully went to bed with visions of violence dancing in my head. The next morning, Astarian was a true pal and let me know I looked absolutely rabid. After expressing I had these murderous desires, he told me to play the vile hand I've been given, and play it I shall. My companions and I packed our things and headed out for a new day of shenanigans. The first thing we come across is our old pal from the Nautiloid, Lazel. She was suspended in the air by tieflings, delivering low blows to her ego. Because Lazel will be useful in my plot, and throwing shade is my job, I attack the tieflings and try to make Lazel use proper manners before I rescue her. She refuses, but at least I tried. After haphazardly shooting the bottom of her cage to release her, Lazel tells me she has a plan. She explains nearby is a Githyanki crash, a hatchery and training grounds for her people that provides purification. This is our first promise of a cure so far, but while the cure is everyone else's priority, it's not really mine, so I make her go to camp and keep exploring. We find the ruins behind where I initially met Shadowheart, and given that she was practically beating the door down to get in, this must be a good place to check out. We are stopped by some guys that make the place seem even more worthy of looting, so I intimidate them and they leave. Easy peasy. We break into the crypt and find mines and lots of enemies. After battling our way through for a while, it becomes apparent we need to rest again before pressing forward. I socialize with my companions a bit and even catch Gale looking at his own mirror image. Vain boy, isn't he? The exchange was merely just to enforce the idea that seramorphosis, the process of becoming a mind flare, is bad. And once again, we have to find a healer. I'm getting to it, okay? Before going to bed, I have another fun exchange with Astarian, where we daydream about the best methods to kill one another, if we inevitably start to turn. Wholesome. After getting some rest, we see Astarian being big sneaky. I wonder what he could be hiding. What could it possibly be? Getting back to the adventure, we find a nice book to punch, skeletons to fight, and a super cool coffin with a really, really, really old dude inside. He's incredibly vague and cryptic, and asks what the worth of a single mortal life. I express life's only value is as currency, and he's somehow satisfied with that answer. He goes on to ominously say, we will meet again at the proper time and place. And it's not long before I find he just decided to crash at my place. Thankfully, he's not useless, and offers his services to resurrect guys. 
companions, and even change my class. Neat. We all rest again, and I seem to be having trouble sleeping. What's now? Thankfully, the insomnia proved useful, and I caught Astarian being an absolute weirdo. Turns out our pale friend here is a vampire. Big shocker. And he really, really wants my blood. Being the big baddie I am, I said absolutely not. I would never willingly invite a vampire to- Okay, maybe I did a little bit. He said it would make him an even stronger ally. But since it made me weaker, I expressed that this is the last time. Astarian goes on to tell me all about being a vampire spawn, and how the tadpole seems to be saving him from the sun. Starting to see some more benefits to this tadpole, there's much to consider. With that being said though, the other companions don't seem so keen to have a vampire in our midst. I tell them if they don't like it, they can leave, and they're pretty quick to accept him. With Astarian now officially exposed as a vampire, with little to no hope he can feed on us, he can now use his teeth as weapons and feed on our enemies. Given that time and time again, I've been given indication we need to find a healer, I decide to head towards Lazel's contact and stumble into a fight. This dude expresses that he's running from goblins and begs to be let in. The tieflings really aren't having it and postpone any efforts to save him. Surprise, surprise, goblins really are chasing him, and they begin to attack. Thankfully for everyone involved, some real hero type pops out of nowhere. I really take no sides in this matter, but since I also want to be let in, I join the fight. After winning and looting, we're surprisingly welcomed in, even though we could be worse than the goblins themselves. Inside the grove, these guys continue to be at odds, but so far, I don't seem to benefit from taking either one side, so I watch things play out. This guy gets paunched, and Shadowheart approves. There seems to be a lot of tension here, and since I'm only here to indulge my companions in their search for a healer, I just stay out of it. I'm informed there are druids in the inner grove that have a renowned healer named Tolson, but only his apprentice is available. Since we now have two avenues for healing, I push forward into the grove. Before making it to the inner grove, we stumble across that big hero boy. He's a warlock like myself named Will that seems to be rising some sort of child army. Talking to him a bit more, he also seems to have a tadpole, and I see his escapades chasing a fellow devil. I decide to keep my friends close and enemies closer, and invite the devil hunter into my party. It's at this point I remember I can disguise myself, so I take the form of an elf and continue to press ahead towards the inner grove. At the entrance, a couple tieflings are fighting with the druids, something about their daughter, yada but, finally, I'm given the attention I deserve. It's not great attention, but it's attention nonetheless. And I'm told someone by the name of Kaga would like to speak with me. Since Kaga seems to be on the way to our healer, I decide to indulge her. After going inside, we find Kaga with the girl everyone was making a big fuss about. Once again, it's none of my business so I simply watch things play out, and they do not really play out so well. It seems Kaga is ruthless, and expects me to call her a monster, but I express that it was quite a show. She goes on to discuss the tensions within the Emerald Grove. The tieflings are refugees, and the druids are trying to perform a ritual that will protect the grove, not only from goblins, but it will shut out the refugees as well. Now, a decent person in this situation would likely side with the tieflings, or at the very least guide them out of the grove to safety, but I am not a decent person. I tell Kaga the refugees are not my concern, 
and since our business has concluded, I go to meet Nettie. Inside the druid's chambers, Nettie seems to be attending to a bird client. After doing whatever this is, the bird seems to be pleased with her services. With her attention now free from my own concerns, I let her check me out. She expresses that I seem pretty healthy, despite looking a bit tired, but I begin to feel like I should inform her of the teensy tiny detail that something crawled into my brain. After realizing I'm speaking of a tadpole, she becomes cautious and invites me into her library, claiming she may be able to help. To my dismay, inside we find a drow that also had a tadpole. I say I'm hoping to find a less grave cure, and she grabs a particularly spiky branch. A little on edge about the dead drow and spiky branch, I ask if that was supposed to help, and she says maybe, then asks more about my symptoms. I decide to be upfront with her about my symptoms, mostly to uncover what she intends to do with that branch. After realizing she fully intended on killing me with that thing, wants me to drink poison, and doesn't have a cure, she's no longer useful to me. I quickly take her out, only to realize I'm totally trapped alone in this library now, with no way to get out. I explore the room a bit to find Halson's journal, as well as an elaborate puzzle. I read just about every book in the library find a way out with the puzzle, but then I remember Nettie was the one to open the door, so she must have something on her. I don't see a key, but since her fancy headband is called Key of the Ancients, I put two and two together and put it on. The slab now opens with ease, and I'm relieved I don't have to do a puzzle right now, just in case killing this woman might have consequences. I decide to take the back way out, and we stumble upon a few goblins. At this point, I've noticed the goblins seem to have an alliance with drows, so I disguise myself to engage with them. Unfortunately, these guys don't seem to care if I'm a drow or not, and they attack. After taking them out, I find a big chest that's clearly trapped, but I make a story and take care of it. At this point, I also decide to change back into my true form, ignore another obvious puzzle, and blaze my way out of the passage despite being blasted by the statues. Since the statues took a bit of a toll on my companions, I decide it's time to go back to camp for another rest, where Withers has a few words for me. Cryptic as always, he tells me. Beyond mortal realms, there doth exist an amalgamation of spirits akin to thine own ensnared by the treacherous cult of the Absolute. Well, that was just to say Withers could resurrect bitter allies for money. Since I'm already pretty set with my current companions, I decide not to take him up on this offer. At least not just yet. I socialize with my companions a bit to discover Shadowheart seems to be hiding something, and Lazel thinks well is an idealist do-gooder and benevolent burden. I find her banter charming and replace Shadowheart for her in my party. As night falls, Shadowheart is struggling with a sharp purple pain in her hand, which she continues to be deceptive about. Since I've already dealt with enough deception from my companions, Starion, I persuade her to come out with it. She gives in and tells me she's a worshipper Shar, mistress of the night. That sounds cool as hell to me, so why should I care? The whole ordeal makes Gale say, blimey though, which I find amusing. I told her I don't care about her Shar worship, only that she was dishonest, and she agrees to be more transparent in the future. Astarian and Will also seem to need a word with me. Astarian seems grateful and a bit flirtatious, given the fact I let him have my blood, and begins to question what the others taste like. I jokingly tell him 
I'm hurt he's looking at other necks, but we go on to indulge in a theoretical debate as to who would taste the best. I decide to flatter him and say I think he would, and he admires my taste. Will just seems to want to ask me how I'm feeling, and I reply that I feel confident. No tadpole will get the best of me. It becomes apparent he was only asking how I was feeling, to have an excuse to tell me how he's feeling. He expresses a concern he's showing no signs of turning, so I offer to dig up a poison mushroom if he's so keen to be sick. He laughed at my silly little joke, but due to other subtle clues, I don't think he actually appreciated it. With my bruised ego, I make everyone go to bed. The next day, we stumble across some absolute cultists we've been hearing so much about. One of them doesn't seem to be doing so hot. As we approach, we are encouraged to stay back, but I notice a symbol marked on one of the cultists' faces. Or at least, I would if my wing wasn't blocking it. Something about this symbol allows me to use my tadpole to command authority, so I take it. The cultist Brenna apologizes profusely and tells me her brother, a true soul, is injured. I realize this true soul they speak of also has a tadpole, and I hold his stare. As our minds intertwine, I realize I can shepherd these cultists, and before passing, he tells his siblings to mind me as another true soul. Now, I know nothing about the cult of the Absolute, but given my profound power over them, I don't disclose that. I play along and ask what happened to their brother, so I don't meet the same fate. They explain they were looking for fugitives from the Nautiloid crash, and that their brother crossed paths with an owl bear. I now know, since we are fugitives from the Nautiloid, the Absolute wants us found. And also, it's probably best to avoid this owl bear without disclosing the minor detail we are the ones they are hunting. I tell the cultists to forget the owl bear and go. After complying, my companions and I have much to discuss. But first, I remove my new druid headband because it's harshing my cold-blooded vibe. Astarian is equally as pleased with our newfound power to influence others, while Lazel finds the parasite to be nothing but a disease, and not to be trusted. I begin to enjoy the balance of my party as Gale advises caution, but admits the power could prove valuable. Now that I have the opportunity to interject, I express such powers of manipulation will be useful, and move on to loot this dead body. It turns out, there's more to this dead body than common loot, and I'm able to take his tadpole to strengthen myself. The whole process is a bit grim, though. After taking his tadpole and charcuterie, we come across another body, carefully guarded by a dog. Because I'm just a little evil and not an absolute monster, I encourage the dog to stand down and find us back at camp. Continuing along the path, we find the so-called devil Will kept going on about, and turns out, despite cussing like a sailor, she's an absolute sweetheart. She recognizes us from the Nautiloid, and expresses gratitude we found her before we crossed paths with self-proclaimed paladins of Tear. It turns out Will is not the only one hunting her, and a woman this sought after must be an important asset. She goes on to explain she was a soldier in the Blood War and the Archdevil Zariel's personal guard. After playing along for ten years, she was finally able to escape, thanks to the Nautiloid ship. However, the paladins hunting her serve Zariel and are keen to return her back, so I agree to eventually take them out so she can serve me. She heads to my camp, and I remember I totally forgot to talk to Lazel's contact at the Grove, so I make sure to head there before replacing Lazel with Karlak in my party. Zoru seemed very nervous about Lazel being there. 
she informed him it was customary for him to bow, and although I have no idea what the history or culture is here, I had her back. After the impromptu course in etiquette, he shared that he saw other Githyankis near the mountain pass on the road to Baldur's Gate. It seems they were not quite as compassionate as us. Now knowing the general location of Lazel's crash, she emphasizes the importance of heading there for purification. But are we going to do that just yet? No, of course not. With Garlac now in our midst, there's bound to be some spicy drama between her and Will back at camp. And spicy drama there is. Will is ready to end her right then and there, but after a series of visions, he sees her trying to escape from Zariel's service. Despite seeing it with his own eyes, Will remains a little stubborn. Telling him he's being stubborn seems to satisfy just about everyone, including Will for some reason, and he backs down. After socializing with everyone a bit more, it seems Will's patron may have been the one behind his order to take out Carlac, but without divulging much, he ominously states the veil will soon be lifted and he'll pay his penance. The next day, we head out to delete the paladins also on Carlac's trail. At first, they insist they aren't servants of Zariel, but I just want to fight someone anyway. If only I could see the fear in their eyes. After much intimidation, they finally admit that they aim to bring Karlak back to Avernus, and she says not uh After we absolutely destroy the imposters, Karlak has earned the right to go absolutely bonkers and burn the place to the ground. After she's all done with that, she explains her heart was replaced with an infernal engine, making her burn as hot as the hells. In order to keep her engine in check, she'll need a mechanic. With Astarian's blood problem, Karlak's heart and Shadow Heart's strange hand thing, I'm beginning to realize I'm becoming a glorified babysitter for these companions. It's about time I focus on my own self-interests. For one, it's beginning to sound like a promising idea to see what the Githyanki can offer. But I'm also curious to see what power can be gained by paying a visit to the goblin camp. I know at this point the camp is filled with cultists. I know I have the power to control, but in case things get wild over there, I first decide to head towards Lazel's people. They seem powerful, and even have a big old dragon. It becomes abundantly clear I don't want to be on their bad side. A man by the name of Kithrak Voss descends from the sky and tells his warriors to stop playing with the locals and find some sort of weapon. Lazel insists it's time we engage with them, regardless of everything we just saw. She approaches the man and introduces herself. I allow her to lead in this conversation because I do not want to. They seem to head it off all right and Voss stresses the importance that she joins the search in finding the weapon they're looking for. Suddenly, I'm overcome with anxiety, and quickly realize we are in possession of the very artifact they are looking for. The artifact is somehow afraid, and knowing nothing about what this weapon does at this point, I silently command Lazel to just play along. She agrees to pretend she will search for the artifact, and they fly away. Despite the strange interaction, Lazel is still hell-bent on pursuing the crash for purification. But that feels like a mission for later. I begin to make the journey towards the goblin camp first. Before we make it there, we are interrupted by a very poetic man. After finishing his strange poem, he introduces himself as Raphael, and despite his facade, he is 100% giving devil vibes. Regardless, he expresses admiration for me, as if he knows me, referring to myself as a cavalier sinner, to see if I can uncover more 
about my past. I ask if he's familiar with my work, and he responds that he's an admirer of the sanguine arts. After exchanging a few pleasantries, he asks that we retire somewhere a bit more quaint. We are suddenly transported to what I can only imagine is a comfy, cozy hell. As charmed and comfortable as I am here, Carlac is decidedly not. Regardless, I compliment his decor. He introduces the location as the House of Hope, and despite offering us a meal, he delivers an ominous line that it might be our last. So I'm no longer keen on eating. I ask if his theatrics are leading anywhere, and he's very disappointed I'm not entertained, and transforms into a devil. I have no idea why my character seems so surprised, especially considering I'm somewhat of a devil myself, but he claims he's our savior. I tell him I don't care what he is, I only care what he wants. Surprise, surprise, he says he can remove our tadpoles in exchange for our souls. Given that these tadpoles seem to be giving me more power, I see this as a lose-lose situation, but Having another devil on my side for the future doesn't sound like a bad plan. I tell him I need to think this over, and we say our goodbyes. After making haste towards the goblin camp, we run into a number of challenges that we overcome through violence, intimidation, and for no reason at all, I just yeeted this guy off a windmill. After another long day of questionable decisions, I decide to head back to camp to catch up with everyone and rest. At camp, Gail seems to have something to say. He expresses he has a condition, and I'm not surprised because everyone else seems to have a condition as well. But I hear him out and ask what kind of condition. He says the specifics are personal, but basically, he needs to eat my good loot. Yeah, he needs to consume the magic within my most powerful items, and I don't like this one bit. Regardless, I ask what would happen if I didn't, and he says, catastrophe. I make sure to say I fail to see why I have to help him, as he's done fine without me so far. But this boy says, please help me. I'm no longer in my fancy tower in water deep without my fancy supply of artifacts. I'm about to say no, but he begins to appeal to my own self-interest. Clever boy. He says he won't be able to fight without the magic, but with it, he can become a powerful boon against the battles ahead. So fine, I'll give him my dumb green items or whatever. Upon ending the day, we get another cutscene. I'm startled by a very cheerful bard named Alfira. She explains she's from the grove and means no harm. I ask her to state her purpose, and for some reason, she's inspired by me. I don't have any idea why people would be talking about me like some sort of hero in the grove. I let the refugee leader get punched. I let a kid get killed, I intimidated the hell out of a guy for information, and I killed their healer's apprentice. But since she really, really insisted she can fight, and Carlac said it's bad luck to turn a bard away from a campfire, I allowed her to stay and went to bed. Okay, well that didn't really pan out so great for her. Turns out these late night violent thoughts also have late night violent tendencies. I allow myself to marvel at my crimes for a moment before considering what to do next. Since I haven't necessarily been trying to paint myself as some sort of hero, I decide to prepare to face the others and not hide any of this. The next morning was an absolute gas. Gods! What the hell is this? Now, I can't help but notice that one of us is positively drenched in blood, so... 
yeah, there's absolutely no hiding from this now, but at least Astarian has my back. I explained that it really wasn't within my control, and the consensus seems to become it must have been the tadpole. Yeah, sure. The tadpole. After everyone settles down a bit, I decide to have a chat with Astarian, and he doesn't seem to mind what I did at all. He does, however, express I could have been a bit more subtle about it. That's fair. The others aren't quite so non-judgmental. I do, however, notice a new dialogue option for Lazel, and decide to engage. She tells me I've gained not only her respect, but also her yearning? Just to be clear, I make sure to ask if she is in fact flirting, because sometimes I never know, and she then makes it abundantly clear that she is. Now, in all of my past lives, I've never romanced Lazel, but this time it kinda makes sense? Why not? It's act one, I can flirt with everyone a little bit as a treat. Weird timing, though. With that out of the way, it's time to make our way into the goblin camp. At the gate, we are confronted by guards, but thanks to my illithid powers, I can easily command authority to make him step aside. Wow. Okay, thankfully, I've saved up some inspiration, and I try rolling again. Perfect. The guard becomes incredibly apologetic, and alerts everyone a true soul is coming through. I take this moment to question what I can expect inside, and he informs me the goblins are having a party to celebrate the capture of a duke. He also goes on to mention there are three higher-ups in the temple. Their boss, a woman by the name of Minthara, and Priestess Gut. Now that I have access to the goblin camp, I start to head towards the party until I'm abruptly halted by the purple brainwaves. I'm still not quite so sure what to call that. This time it's a bit more intense than usual, and we hear a disembodied voice as our consciousness descends into the dark. I receive a vision of three figures an armored male elf, a handsome younger man, and a pale young woman. The voice goes on to introduce these figures as their chosen, and to aid in their search for a weapon. Man, a lot of people really want this weapon, huh? This message continues with the promise that, in exchange, I'll be worthy to stand beside them. The vision fades and repels as I'm confronted with the artifact that's been in my party's possession. It becomes clear that this is, without a doubt, the weapon everyone wants, and it's instrumental in protecting the group from external forces. Thanks to the artifact, we are now free to move into the goblin camp. My priority is to meet the higher-ups the guard spoke of, but I certainly don't stop myself from having a good time at the party. The first higher up we meet is Priestess Gut, and she makes me feel nice and even calls me special, but then she wants to brand me, so I no longer feel as keen to become fast friends. I ask if this brand has a purpose, and she simply says it shows one's devotion to the absolute. Thankfully, when I decide to pass, She's understanding, and says I probably don't need it as a true soul like her. Our minds converge, and I see a vision of her receiving instruction from one of the Chosen. As I push deeper into her mind, she says she can see my thoughts as well. She goes on to note the strange shadows in my mind, and that she can help with them. But I ultimately decide, meh. Instead, I shapeshift again to save my cutscenes, enjoy some more party shenanigans, and meet the next higher up, Minthara. Minthara seems to be frustrated with the goblins, as they haven't been successful 
in finding some sort of sanctuary. As I approach, she merges her mind with me, but seems to be real gentle about it. From her mind, I see a vision of Minthara listening to another of the Chosen, the pale-eyed young woman. She doesn't seem all that impressed by her. She seems even less impressed by me, though, as I'm taking the form of an elf. Regardless of her distaste for my form, she asks that I join her hunt, and I ask what are we hunting. She goes on to describe the weapon, which we now know we have, and how she's certain it's within the Emerald Grove. She seeks to destroy the grove, and claim the weapon in the Absolute's name. The artifact doesn't seem to be super happy about this. Minthara also mentions she's apprehended a thief who tried to flee to the grove, and that they are working to get information from him. Her mind begins to close around mine, and I have only three options. Warn the tieflings, kill her, or lead her to the tieflings to earn her trust. While I'm no worshipper of the Absolute, my character has no attachments to the grove, and Minthara seems like a useful ally. I tell her we don't need the prisoner, and proceed to show her where it is. She seems delighted, but is very quick to involve me in their plot. I didn't really care to involve myself in all of this, but agree to it regardless in case there's some sort of pizza party. Karlak was decidedly not having any of this, but Astarian was having it quite a bit and started flirting? Really? Right in front of my Githyanki girlfriend? Okay, well, Lazel and I aren't really that close yet, so why not? At this point, I know we are getting close to passing the point of no return, so I wanted to get as many cutscenes as possible for Act 1. I decide to head to camp and rest a few times. I had to google if there was any sort of time limit for the Grove Raid, but ultimately decided, worst case scenario, I wouldn't have to fight, and maybe Minthara would take care of things. In the first cutscene, my character seems to be going through it, and I would be too if I had wings that clipped through absolutely everything. I decide to rub my aching hands, and begin to feel a Lazel romance scene on the horizon, but I was very wrong. It seemed she was simply here to murder me for the crime of massaging my hands, I guess. She's being a tad bit dramatic, so I persuade her to lower the blade before doing something foolish. Thankfully, she complies, but insists she will be watching. I'm starting to second-guess the effectiveness of this romance. In the next cutscene, I'm awoken in a strange realm by a dream visitor. I'm excited to see it's the guardian I made at the beginning of the game, and I'm very much admiring my handiwork. I state that I've heard his voice before, and he says he's saved me before, and he's here to save me again. As charmed as I am, I help myself up from the ground. He admires my stubbornness, and tells me of the great potential within my parasite. He encourages me to continue to nurture its power, and in turn, he will keep it from consuming me. He also shows me this real trippy fight going on. Yeah, I don't really know what's happening, but he abruptly says he has to go. Something explodes, and he pushes me back. I would disregard this as some sort of strange dream, but... It seems I'm not the only one who had this dream. While I seek some of my companion's feedback about the dream visitor, I've mostly made up my mind that I want to harness the tadpole's power and end the day again. As night falls, something seems to be rumbling beneath the earth, and she looks good. Turns out this is Mizora, Will's patron and he's in a bit of trouble with her. This is clearly not a good time to flirt, but to Will and Carlac's dismay, I decide to do it anyway. I can't help it though, she looks just like me, 
and I'm incredibly vain. Mizora goes on to scold Will that Karlak is still alive, thus breaking their deal. As punishment, she transforms him into... a devil? A tiefling? I don't know, but this doesn't seem like a good punishment because he looks cool as hell now. She ends the conversation by saying their pact still stands, and she disappears. Karlak is honored, Will is dismayed, and I take another nap. Unfortunately, this isn't the cozy snooze I thought it would be, and I jolt awake with so many questions about my dark urges. I'm in a bit of a contemplative mood and decide to go for a late night walk. Is it contemplative or contemplative? Uh, I don't know. As I ponder the death of Alfira and question why I can't remember it, I'm approached. The interesting little guy introduces himself as Celeritus Fell. Scelaritus Fell? My loyal and ever adoring butler. As joyful as I am to find out I have a butler, I question him about it. He goes on to say, I've always struggled to conduct myself properly without him. Then he presents me with a gift for killing the bard. A gift he describes as bearing a part of my inheritance. I urge him to tell me everything about my life, but unfortunately, he is forbidden to interfere, and departs. When I awake, I equip my cool new cape, dye it black, and play a little tune on my lute. Will is the only one that seems to enjoy it, and pays me with one gold coin. Now that I have a small taste of power, I take it upon myself to gain more, and consume one of the tadpoles. The dream visitor seems pleased with this, and since I haven't grown tentacles, I'm pretty pleased with this as well. Astarian, on the other hand, is a little sad I didn't share, and I tell him maybe another time. Ending the day this time doesn't seem to yield a cutscene. But going to bed triggers Astarian's romance scene. I know including this scene would make for very intriguing content, but I'm a classy lady. Okay, well, maybe not that classy, but I am a bit bashful, so I won't kiss and tell. Something important to note, though, is he divulged a bit more information about his past. It was impossible to ignore he had intricate markings carved into his back, which Astarian noted as being given to him by his former master, Cazador. The next morning, I noticed that, despite sleeping for three days straight, Minthara is still waiting on me to help attack the grove. Although I'm still really dragging my feet on this, I've never done this in a past life, and the time is now. I head inside the grove, inform Sevlor it's nothing personal, and a member of my party permanently leaves. I have no idea who it is at this point, but I can imagine Will and Karlak won't be too pleased about this. After clearing the gate, Minthara and I merge brains, and she commands me to clear the rest of the grove. This better be one good pizza party. After clearing most of the grove, I assume Gail's going to berate me for my behavior, but he only wants a snack. After giving Gail a tasty pair of gloves, we carry on to clear the rest of the grove and meet with Minthara. I tell her it's been a privilege to fight alongside her, even though I barely saw her, and she shares that she feels a bond between us. After a very spicy vision, I don't know if I'm collecting more boyfriends and girlfriends, or war crimes. She goes on to say she will come to my camp tonight to celebrate our victory. Alright, the moment we've been waiting for. The pizza party of the century, and I don't see a single stuffed crust in sight. Karlak is also pretty peeved about it, which is valid. Despite the lack of pie, though, Minthara is thrilled, 
and it's clear I'm quickly rising to power within the cult of the absolute. As a gift, I'm given another tadpole in a fancy bottle and a very messy celebration. At this point, I notice not only Karlak has left the party, but Will has as well. To cope with these feelings of abandonment, I decide to chat with my remaining allies. Astarian is eager to spend another evening together. After sharing that, I'm undecided on what I want to do. He uses every possible pickup line he can think of. As much as I adore Astarian, I suggest another time, because I know there won't be another unique cutscene, and I'm eager to peruse my other options. As I approach Minthara, she's a bit more direct in her methods. She shows me with the tadpole connection exactly what she has in mind. Because this is my first encounter with Minthara, and I have no idea if she's a romantic option long term, who am I to say no? After nervously leaving that conversation, I strike up a chat with Shadowheart. Now, speaking out of character here, I was a bartender for many years, and I know this girl isn't happy drinking so I try to dig deeper into her mind to see what's going on. As a worshipper of Shar, she seems conflicted. While the decisions we made are all good with the Lady of Loss, I don't think it feels all good to Shadowheart. While I try to uncover a bit more, I'm a little relieved she declines to think about it further. It's probably for the best she doesn't so I don't lose another party member. Speaking of that, I completely skip past Gale because I'm almost certain he would want to leave, and I've invested too much loot for him to bail now. I run straight to Lazel to see what's up with her. Alright, this woman is an efficient communicator. Since that's all she has to say this evening, I chat with some of the goblins. A few are huddled around what I was hoping would be a tasty punch bowl, but they're doing some sort of blood ritual. I decline to participate. Thankfully, what they lack in good punch is made up for with a stolen instrument. Unfortunately, I don't have will to throw a coin at me anymore, and these goblins seem stingy. With my new loot in hand, I head over to Withers to see he's a party animal, but he just says what he always does. I decide to push the conversation further by asking him what he is exactly. He gives a vague non-answer and, pushing the topic further, I ask him to explain, which results in the response, No. Well, at least we know that Withers is no social butterfly. As the party nears its end, I'm confronted with a choice as to who I wish to spend the evening with, but I'll leave that for another time. I know Act 2 typically starts by crossing into the Shadow Realms, but it's getting late, and we should all get some rest. Unless, of course, you're at work or driving. Maybe not, though. But let me know if you're interested in seeing the rest of this adventure in the comments below. In other news, I started a Patreon to make it possible to dedicate more time to the channel and make the best quality videos I can. Some perks include behind the scene posts, early access to videos, and even exclusive videos. A special thanks to my first patrons. Brayden R, Gamender, Clark, Ryan W, Rejack, Leo, and Just Jack. Your support means the world to me, and I look forward to all of our adventures to come. Sweet dreams, unless you're working or driving, and I'll see you next time.